Hello, everybody. Welcome. My name is Jennifer Kaur. I'm the Executive Director of the Tennessee Historical Society, and this is our series, Tennessee 101. Uh, this is the third section of basic history of Tennessee, Reconstruction to the Present. Our guide through this part of Tennessee's history is Dr. Carol Busey. Dr. Busey is the Davidson County Historian and is Professor of History at Volunteer State Community College. She's a much in-demand speaker on the topics of Tennessee history and women's history, and she is currently working on a textbook of Tennessee history that I think is going to be 500 pages long when she's done with it. So <laughs> Carol is going to take us from immediately after the Civil War with this particular lecture. So Carol, if you want to just go ahead. Thank you so much, Jennifer. I'm delighted to be back with all of you again and to have an occasion to share with you some of the things I've learned about this particular part of Tennessee history that I personally think is just so incredibly interesting because here we have ended the Civil War, which has changed so much of the political, social, economic fabric of our state. And what are we going to do now? What will the state of Tennessee be now that the Civil War has ended? Will we continue to be a state whose economy is based on agriculture? Or will we become a more industrialized state as Henry Grady, the editor of the Atlanta Constitution had suggested that all states of the former Confederacy become a state of the new South. The new South being an industrialized state uh, and the old South being the way it was with plantations as a basic component of the economy. So what really happened in Tennessee? Tennessee, as you know, if you've heard me speak before, Tennessee is very unique from the other 10 states that left the Union. And the story that many of us, if we are of a certain age, let's just say over 65 perhaps, we heard a version if we grew up in the South that the South was destroyed in every way by the Civil War. And now over the years, we have heard that story gradually being told in different ways. And the, the narrative of the history of what actually happened has been interpreted and reinterpreted as historians have had more and more access to the primary documents that really tell the story of the Civil War. So Tennessee escaped military reconstruction. It was the only state of the former Confederacy to do that. What did that mean? That meant that all of those other 10 states had U.S. Army soldiers in their state uh, because they were there to protect the rights of the freedmen, the former enslaved people. So as a result of that, and Tennessee was the first Southern state to be readmitted into the Union. We ratified the 13th Amendment, which freed the slaves, but enslaved people, but we also had already freed the enslaved people by an amendment to our state constitution before we ratified the amendment to the United States Constitution. Again, we were the only Southern state that willingly did that uh, before the Constitution amendment to the US Constitution. So we did not suffer here in Middle Tennessee a significant amount of damage in the city of Nashville, the capital of our state, because the Union Army was here for most of the war, the city having fallen early in the war in the early spring of 1862. So Nashville was ready to go, its businesses were ready to get going again, and indeed it did. And so did Tennessee have to rebuild itself or did Tennessee simply eventually just try to, to, to bring back, to restore all of the components that, of that Tennessee before the Civil War? Was it restoration or was it complete reconstruction? 
Now, of course, there were a lot of things to deal with and people, some people, particularly the Confederates, veterans who had come back, they were demoralized. They were really distressed that they had not been victorious in this war. And in places where there are significant populations of African-Americans who had been both freed men as well as enslaved men and women before the Civil War, there is tension in those places because there are, are ex-Confederates who have been so demoralized. Memphis has a significant population of, of African Americans, and it's only a matter of time before uh, trouble breaks out between white supporters of the Confederacy and the African American community in Memphis. We had uh, the African American community uh, was was put under siege in in a, in a way in that whites came out they attacked the African Americans they burned houses they burned schools they burned churches it was two days of what now is being called a massacre but was originally called a riot Dr Stephen Ash a respected retired professor at the from the University of Tennessee has written a very fine book about the Memphis massacre in 1866. It's a slim volume, but it really has tremendous research in it. And if you're interested in this, I certainly recommend this. The subject of language is important now, and we see this quite regularly. For example, this engagement, if you will, this event that took place was originally referred to as a riot. Now, we in the South often have a racial connotation with a riot. We, we automatically put the word race in front of the word riot. And during the Civil War sesquicentennial, uh, uh, 2016, to, uh, excuse me, I got the date wrong, the sesquicentennial of the Civil War, uh, 2016, six to six, 2000, I, I, keep, I keep being tongue twisted with that. So I will, I will just say the sesquicentennial of the Civil War, when that took place, the African-American population of Memphis wanted a historic marker that recognized the massacre. And there was a great debate over whether it should be called a massacre or a riot. And so in this time, those words are still even today being debated as to what is the more appropriate, but African Americans were killed here, much of their community building the fabric of their community was destroyed and the, the monument, the historical marker there says the Memphis massacre. Now, one of the many things that happened uh, in Tennessee to help the formerly enslaved people was that the United States Congress created the Freedmen's Bureau. The Freedmen's Bureau was an organization created to help enslaved people enter American society as citizens and free people. They appointed as the senior officer here in Tennessee and Kentucky, a Union Army General Clinton B. Fisk. He came to Tennessee. Uh, African Americans really appreciated the work of the Freedmen's Bureau. The Freedmen's Bureau did a lot of legal things to help the formerly enslaved people, such as helping them get married and get marriage certificates. They, they were not legally allowed to marry in Tennessee and now they are legally allowed to marry and have marriage certificates. Here is one from the Freedmen's Bureau in Wilson County. And you see this couple had had several children, some of which were adults when they were married in Wilson County after the Civil War. Education was a great desire of the freed people in the state of Tennessee. And so the Freedmen's Bureau 
enabled and encouraged missionary groups from northern religious denominations to come into Tennessee and the rest of the South and open schools because African Americans needed an education if they were going to be able to be independent. Fisk University today began as Fisk Free School for Coloreds here in Nashville. Uh, it helped the founding and thriving of this institution that Nashville had a significant population of free Blacks living here before the Civil War who were able to provide the core of the leadership for the African American community here after the war ended. The Napier family was a family of free Blacks. They had educated their children, including their son, James Napier, who will eventually be appointed treasurer of the United States by President William Howard Taft. He became a lawyer, he was a businessman. The African-American community in all of the major cities of Tennessee had a thriving, but perhaps in some places small, a thriving commercial section of town where there were businesses, businesses owned and operated by African Americans. So the Freedmen's Bureau helps the missionaries make the arrangements to start these schools. And the American Missionary Association came and founded Fisk. And one of the reasons that they named it for Clinton B. Fisk was because he had made a significant personal contribution financially to the, the establishment of this school in Nashville. You see Lemoyne Normal and Commercial School being started in Memphis. Again, another group of missionaries had come down and, and, and established this school. Lane College in Jackson, Tennessee was established during this period of time. Knox College had been established by the Presbyterians in Knoxville in 1864 after the Union Army claimed and, and liberated Knoxville. It had been held by the Confederate Army for part of the Civil War. And once the Union Army retook Knoxville, the Presbyterians there started Knox College. You have uh, for a brief period of time in Nashville, the Colored Tennessee College. There are colleges being founded, schools, and the concept was generally to teach teachers. The idea was that these people who were educated would go out into rural areas and teach the formerly enslaved people the basic skills of reading, writing, and math necessary for independence. One of the students who came to Fisk University, not because he chose to come to Fisk University, but because he was more or less limited in the options where he could go, was none other than W.B.E. W.E.B. Du Bois. W.E.B. Du Bois grew up in Great Mass Barrington, Massachusetts. He was probably the only African American in his class. He was the valedictorian of his high school, and he had his sights set on going to Harvard. But after Fisk University was established, and after Howard University was established in Washington, D.C., uh, Harvard and others in Massachusetts told him that he should go to one of these colleges. And so he came to Nashville, and he had never been around formerly enslaved people or just the institution of slavery itself. So when he was sent out one summer during his years at Fisk, into White County to teach, he was really, really shocked at the conditions under which these formerly enslaved people lived. He wrote about that in his book of essays, The Souls of Black Folk. We also have Meharry Medical College created here in Nashville, which will begin training African-American doctors, a very strong institution for providing African-Americans with health care. The Southern Methodists want to found a college 
in uh, Middle Tennessee somewhere. Uh, this is Reconstruction and the churches want to establish colleges. The denominations want to establish colleges. And they decide to put a college in Nashville that will become the Central Southern Methodist University. Well, they didn't have money to get this college going. And so the Methodist bishop's wife reached out to one of her distant relatives who happened to be the, the wife of Commodore Vanderbilt. And Commodore Vanderbilt gave a substantial amount of money so that the Methodists could get their college established. And the Methodists then named it for Commodore Vanderbilt, Vanderbilt University. Now, I know that we do have some Vanderbilt alumni with us tonight, and this is Kirkland Hall, which still stands on the campus, but this building ha has been hit over the years by a significant fire, as well as some weather events, and so that does not have both of these towers up on top of it, but I encourage you to, if you live in a town where these colleges are today, whatever they are, go walk around all their campuses. Go walk around the campus of Lane College in Jackson. Go walk around the campus of, of Fisk University here or Vanderbilt University. Now, let's talk politics for a minute. In the beginning, when the Civil War ended and Andrew Jackson had gone to Washington two months before the end of the war, I guess, uh, to get himself sworn in as vice president of the United States. The General Assembly met. It was an assembly of unionists. Keep in mind, at the time it, it, it reorganized itself, the ex-Confederates are going to lose their political rights. And the governor who succeeded Andrew Johnson was William G. Brownlow. He was an East Tennessee Whig. He really very much was opposed to secession, but he comes in and his philosophy of dealing with the ex-Confederates is to punish them for what they did, punish them for the 600,000 plus lives that the war had cost, make sure that they did not ever return to power. Now, as you can imagine, he reacts in that way. So there's going to be a reaction to his reaction. And that reaction surfaces down in Pulaski, but it surfaced all across the South. There were various versions of this. Uh, they first surfaced down in Pulaski as the Q Klux Klan. It was more or less a fraternal organization, but they will ultimately uh, become a little more active and they start harassing African-Americans to keep them from the polling places. The freed men, they are trying to intimidate and prevent them from voting. And what they're really doing is trying to make a statement. And think about this. If there are any psychologists in the crowd, they can speak to this as well. People who feel powerless often strike out at people who they perceive to be slightly weaker than they are. This is often the cause of domestic violence. And you see this in racial tensions uh, uh, throughout history, throughout all of history. So this group gets started, but they have a perfect target with Governor Brownlow because he is so incredibly determined to keep the ex-Confederates, and keep in mind ex-Confederate generals founded the Klan, he is so determined to keep them down. So they start harassing him and he gets the legislature to pass an act uh, against the Klan. That doesn't stop them. They hire a detective. Uh, Brownlow hires a detective to go infiltrate the Klan. The detective, Seymour Barmore, found out all about the Klan, but he didn't make it back from Pulaski to Nashville to share what he had learned with Governor Brownlow because somewhere along the way, he was taken off the train and his body was found later in a river 
in South Central Tennessee. Governor Brownlow then gets the legislature to take other action. He gets the legislature to give him the right and authority to judge elections in counties and throw out the results if he doesn't think they are uh, uh, what he wants them to be. And so Governor Brownlow further insults the Confederates by not only has, has he taken their voting rights away, but now he's going to even judge the elections in these counties. And so this causes a split in the unionists. And I, I use the word unionists here and not the word Republicans because these people had not yet identified as the Republican Party of Tennessee, which will come very soon, but these were unionists. And so you've got the radical unionists with the personification of Governor Brownlow who wants to punish the ex-Confederates. And then you have these more conservative unionists who want to bring kindness to the table. They look at these ex-Confederates as their neighbors. They know that they're going to have to live in peace together, go to church together, work together. So they want reconciliation to some degree. And so you begin to see Brownlow's radical regime losing popularity with each passing year. Brownlow sees the handwriting on the wall and he decides that he's had enough of this and he will get the state legislature to appoint him to be uh, one of Tennessee's two United States senators. This means that the Lieutenant Governor DeWitt Center, who had been a radical, a radical unionist, and this gives him the seat of governor. Now, the lieutenant governor in Tennessee was not and is not elected by the entire population of the state. The lieutenant governor of Tennessee is elected by the members of the Tennessee Senate. DeWitt Center is the governor he really actually likes being governor. He thinks we've had enough of the radicals. And so what he does is he sort of beats Brownlow at his own game. He, the, Brownlow had gotten the General Assembly to give the governor the power to throw out elections and control county voting regulations. So DeWitt Center restores the voting rights of the ex-Confederates and the ex-Confederates will come back to power. And so what the ex-Confederates do when they come back, when they're elected to the General Assembly, they will decide that it's time to write a brand new constitution for the state of Tennessee, the Constitution of 1870. It makes a few changes here and there, uh, but the overwhelming thing that this constitution did was make it very, very difficult to amend or change this document because the ex-Confederates did really want to stay in power and did not want to ever go through this experience again. Among the things that, that were in this constitution that don't get acted on initially was that the constitution did allow for the creation of a poll tax, in other words, a tax on voting. But once the ex-Confederates come into power, although we do have African-Americans elected to the General Assembly, by 1900, there are no more African-Americans in the General Assembly as these ex-Confederates, the Democratic Party in Tennessee is really the controlling party. Tennessee does have a strong but small minority Republican Party largely centered in East Tennessee. And the Democrats are so big that they debate things, issues from time to time and split. And unlike other Southern states, 
Tennessee will elect a Republican governor or a third party governor from time to time when the Democratic Party splits. They split over a lot of different things during the next years as the state begins to grow again. Now here is the first African American to be elected to the Tennessee General Assembly. He was from Nashville. He served one term. He was a barber. He gets himself educated. He's a highly respected citizen in Nashville. His statue is in the Capitol building on the second floor, just outside the House chamber. There were, I think, 14 in all African American representatives in the Tennessee General Assembly before the last one uh, finishes his last term. One of the most noteworthy of these representatives was Samuel Allen McElwee. He was from West Tennessee. He was from Haywood County. And he got elected to three different terms. He served six years in the General Assembly. What is really remarkable about him is in 1887, his first year in the General Assembly, he dares to give a speech in the legislature on mob violence. Mob violence not only means uh, uh, ra ra riots and massacres, it really now is coming to mean lynchings, the execution of a person without due process of law by citizens rather than our court system. And he was, from, he was from West Tennessee, so he knew all about a lynching that had taken place in Jackson, Tennessee, uh, right before he had come to, to Nashville to be our state uh, uh, representative from that part of the state. So he is concerned about a woman named Eliza Woods, who was uh, hanged on the courthouse square in Jackson. Eliza Wood was a domestic. She was working for a family, the Wooten family. Uh, the Wootens, uh, their Jesse and Mary Chandler Wooten had given birth to a daughter in 1883. The child was very, very fragile, small and sickly, and it was determined that the child was not going to live very long. The child died about a year after she was born. And then 16 months after the child dies, Mrs. Wooten gets sick and she dies as well. She was 25 years old. And Almost immediately, her husband and her family accuse Eliza Wood of poisoning her to death. Now, she has a funeral. Mrs. Wooten has a funeral. She is buried, but they, they go through the house and find in Eliza Wood's room a, a very potent kind of rat killer and some other things that were were dragged in as evidence that uh, she had poisoned Mrs. Wooten. So even though she was dead and buried, they had her body disinterred. Her, the contents of her stomach, what they had left there, was then sent to Nashville to a doctor to examine it and examined the contents of this rat poisoning called rough on rats, which turned out to be totally arsenic. And so the fact that this was evidence in her room, this really in the citizens of Jackson's mind and her family was evidence that she poisoned not only the mother, but a, a 16 months earlier had poisoned the child. And so the citizens of Jackson take the law into their own hands. She is, Eliza Wood is arrested. She has put in jail in Jackson, but wouldn't you know it, the mob runs to the jail. They drag her out and at 9 p.m. after stripping all her clothes off of her, she is hanged in front of a crowd of about a thousand 
that the New York Times reported was a very well-behaved crowd. She is hanged uh, on the courthouse square in Jackson. Now that's not really where the story ends here, but this is what was the, the pretext of the, the speech that Samuel McElwee gave at the General Assembly. It hasn't completely played out when he gives his speech, but he is angered by this speech, the fact that she did not get a trial the way that this was handled. Well, about five years later, her husband who has moved to Nashville uh, comes back to Jackson. He is babbling. He is saying all manner of things and he seems to have actually lost his mind. He seems to be totally distressed. And suddenly the version of the story of, of, of Eliza Wood executing or poisoning uh, her uh, employer takes a turn for the worst. He reappears, people say he's hopelessly insane. And he said, this is what he said that was quoted. He was, had been authorized by the almighty God to kill somebody in order to save his wife's soul. And so he was violent. He was put in jail. Uh, he was declared insane. And he lived out the rest of his life in the Tennessee Insane Asylum in Nashville. Now, another advocate for lynching becomes Ida B. Wells from Memphis, uh, a friend of hers wa who was in partnership with three other African-Americans wa were taken out of their grocery store and killed in Memphis, the lynching at the curve. And Ida B. Wells, who was a teacher and a newspaper editor of an African-American paper, really organized right then and there a campaign against lynching, lacking court procedures and executing African Americans. She publishes books, she goes on speaking tours, she will live out the rest of her life in Chicago. Her newspaper office is burned. That, needless to say, what she is saying about lynching is brutal and hard to listen to. And the editor of one of the newspapers that is a white editor, uh, white editor, Edward Ward Carmack, will really heavily criticize Ida B. Wells, calling her that wench, she needs to be run out of town, all manner of derogatory remarks about Ida B. Wells. But she is a Tennessee woman who really came to international acclaim because of her determination to stop the process of lynching. The last African-American to serve in the General Assembly was Jesse Graham. And then by 1900, we have no more African-Americans in this General Assembly until after the modern day civil rights movement. What about labor in all of those cotton fields? Well, slavery is replaced with sharecropping. And sharecropping is a system whereby formerly enslaved people are allowed to live in the cabin where they had lived before the end of slavery. They work the same land. They are, are not paid in cash, but it is a shared profit system whereby when the crop is harvested, the landowner takes out of the sale of the crop the rent for the cabin, the use of the seeds, the use of the farm implements. And because many of these formerly enslaved field workers did not have an education, they did not understand how to calculate the math and often uh, were, were in situations where if they disputed the landowner's math, they would face severe physical punishment. And so as a result of this, we have sharecropping across the South. Now, certainly there were some white sharecroppers in, in Tennessee as well as on other states, but the African Americans were treated with great harshness due primarily to racism. 
So here you see the, the thinness of these children. Everybody is picking cotton. If you've ever been around a cotton plant, they've got some stickers on them and uh, they are very hard on your fingers. Uh, if you're an adult, it's hard to bend over. You have to bend over to pick the cotton bowls, and they're very hard to get that, that cotton pulled off of the plant, so it is very, very difficult work. Now, there are some people in Tennessee who say, we need to diversify. We need to become more of an industrial place. In 1877, partly out of allegiance to Tennessee for its uh, being readmitted to the United States first after the Civil War, President Rutherford B. Hayes comes to Nashville. Nashville has been granted a new customs house. A customs house is the place where initially the tariffs were collected. Nashville had a customs house because we were on the river and the federal government was primarily financed by tariffs, import, uh, if you will, taxes until the creation of the federal income tax during the progressive era. So he comes to lay the cornerstone for Nashville's magnificent courthouse and every town in Tennessee, every city that has a customs house the buildings are beautiful. The one in Memphis is really quite an elegant building. So these new South supporters, Rutherford B. Hayes says the Civil War is over, and these new South supporters say, yes, we want to industrialize. Many of the people who come and actually found factories in Tennessee and mills for ironworks and other products are former union officers who saw the potential of this area. And so you see these plants being built at Rockwood, Chattanooga. You see these all over East Tennessee. They will eventually move in this direction and start moving westward. So this is one image that shows the new South with the factory and the old South picking cotton which will Tennessee build? The railroads become the power behind the throne in the General Assembly uh, after the ex-Confederates come back to power. Governor Brownlow had seen to it that the railroads were rebuilt after the Civil War by getting the General Assembly to issue bonds for the rebuilding of the railroads. So as a result of this, when Brownlow leaves the state, what the legislature has as these bonds become due is a state debt. How are we going to pay it off? The ex-Confederates are now back in power and they have a lot of different ideas about how we're going to pay it off. The debt was $43 million. Who bought these bonds? Mostly Northern Investment firms or people who had some expendable capital and this looked like <clears throat> a good deal. The General Assembly, they don't know whether they want to do this or not because these are Yankees in their opinion that have invested in this. So they start debating how they're going to deal with the debt. At one point, the state defaults on some payments. And this is when some of the Democrats, the ex-Confederates say, we got to deal with this. We got to handle this situation now. Now, here is how Tennessee politicians are divided. And this spills over into the General Assembly. Over here, Aishin G. Harris, former governor, supporter of the Confederacy, he wants to just forget about the debt, default on it, let it go. He is among this group that want to redeem the South, bring it back like it was. So look, look at the financial hit he and all of the other slave owners received when slavery was abolished. This is his philosophy of justifying why they should just forget about paying the debt and let it go, let these people take a financial hit. He said, look at the financial hit we took. We made an investment and we lost it. You made an investment, you're gonna lose yours. 
Now then you've got Arthur C. St. Clair Collier on the other side who says, oh, we can't do this because it's going to ruin our credit rating. And he is really for the New South. He wants an industrial state. And so right in the middle, you have former Confederate General William Brimage Bate, who says, OK, we can't pay it off. We can't forget about it. So we've got to come up with a deal. We've got to come up with a compromise here. And before this compromise gets made, look what's happened. A Republican has been elected governor of Tennessee. So Bate now starts, once that Alvin Hawkins becomes governor, he really starts talking about, we've got to make a compromise. We've got to have a deal. We've got to have a deal. So this is his solution, and the General Assembly ultimately approves it. Payment in full to any institution that has bought these bonds that is an educational, literary, or charitable institution, a nonprofit, in other words, pay them in full for the value of the bond. And one citizen in Tennessee will be paid the full value. No, it's not Isham G. Harris. It's not William Rimage Fate. It's not anybody you would think of necessarily, but a woman with a great deal of influence, even at this time. Sarah Childress Polk. She was the respected woman of the state, certainly the most influential woman in Nashville for sure. People came to pay homage to her after the war, as well as during the Civil War. She was paid in full. Her husband had been president of the United States, even though she really supported the Confederacy. And everybody else who bought these bonds, these Northern investors, they were paid 50% plus a 3% uh, amount of interest. So they got 50 cents on the dollar for their investment and then an additional 3%. And Bate is in power now and the crisis is over. Now, our next crisis that's going to really distress the Democrats is what to do with the prison population. Why has the prison population grown so fast? Because before the Civil War, African Americans were never really in incarcerated in a state prison. All punishment for an African American who might create a crime was handled by the owners of the enslaved people. Yes, there were some free blacks who would have been in the court system, but all of the punishment of African Americans was not primarily on enslaved people and it was done by the owners. So now the owners don't necessarily have any power now. And we're arresting African Americans for vagrancy. We have vagrancy laws. African Americans are arrested for a host of crimes. And so the prisons are overflowing with people. And is it any surprise that the General Assembly does not want to spend more money on prisoners? So what are we going to do about this? Well, They've got all these regulations regulating what African-Americans can do, but they have their prisons full and they got to figure out something. So Arthur St. Clair Collier, he has a plan. How about we rent those prisoners out to businesses to perform labor? And the railroads also many times owned coal mines in, on the Cumberland Plateau and in East Tennessee. So the idea is that you are going to bring the prisoners to these coal mines, put them in there to do the mining, have your guards sitting there smoking a cigar at the, the entrance to the mine. Security will be easy because there's no way for these uh, prisoners to get out of prison. And so that's what the legislature decides to do. Well, <clears throat> anybody mad about this? Yes, the miners. This is their sole livelihood. They have families to feed. And so what develops 
is known as the Coal Miners' War, taking place up along Walden's Ridge in East, East uh, Tennessee, the Cumberland Plateau, East Tennessee area, where the miners strike back. They capture the guards, they let the prisoners out, the prisoners are put on trains and sent to Knoxville. And our governor through all of this is Governor Buchanan, who will call up the state guard to do something about this. Now, if you know Bob Buchanan, who is the former president of the Tennessee Historical Society, this is his uh, ancestor. He is on John Price Buchanan's family tree. So he calls up the state militia to put the prisoners back in the mines and restore the guards to guarding it. So what you have up there is, is basically warfare. The state guard is fighting the miners. And look, somebody has one of these, oh, it's probably a civil war cannon here. But there is actual fighting going on with armed men, uh, in some of which are in uniforms. And guess what? This does not get good press in Tennessee because suddenly you have a group of people who are very much supportive of the miners who have lost their jobs. And, and Peter Turney will run for governor on a, a, a platform to end this. Uh, Peter Turney will, will run on a platform to keep this going, but his opponent will say, we've got to abolish this and not do this anymore. So it becomes a political issue in Tennessee. And eventually, after the National Guard has, it's costing the state money, eventually the General Assembly will say, we got to build some prisons. And so what they end up doing is building the Brushy Mountain Prison uh, in on the Cumberland Plateau area and the main prison in Nashville, the Tennessee State Prison in Nashville. The Brushy Mountain Prison can be seen from afar if you take that hike in uh, Frozen Head State Park. And the main prison is still owned by the state. It's being rehabbed for some other purposes, but that building still exists and Brushy Mountain Prison still exists. This prison has not held prisoners since the creation of the River Bend uh, Penal Institution. The cost of these prisons, only $800,000. But the legislature realized they had to do it. They had no choice. Now, in 1894, we have probably one of the most interesting elections in all of our history because Peter Turney is running as a Democrat, but H. Clay Evans is a Republican. And then we have this third party, the populist candidate, uh, Professor Mims from Nashville, who is, is, is running on a People's Party kind of progressive platform. Okay, election takes place. Turney, 104,000 votes. Evans, 105,000 votes. Mims, 23,000 votes. Well, it looks to me like Evans won, right? Well, the General Assembly has to approve the results of the election. So when the General Assembly comes back into town in January, they start examining these votes and they conclude that there were 23,000 votes in guess what part of the state, East Tennessee, that were not legal. There was voter fraud in East Tennessee the predominantly Republican part of the state. So H. Clay Evans did not get sworn in as governor and Peter Turney returned to the office of governor. So here we have it. What is Tennessee going to be like when we move into the next century? As a way to discuss that and see it, Tennessee decides to have a World's Fair. World's Fair fever was going on all over the country at this point in time, and Tennessee wanted to have a World's Fair. Tennessee had suffered greatly in the Panic of 1893, and this was a way to celebrate our state and to bring some recovery to the state. The main 
promoters of this uh, included the railroad lines that had lost a lot of business during the depression, the panic of 1893. So property is bought in Nashville on the west side of town. Plans are made. Uh, cities around the state will have pavilions. There's It's showcasing industry and progress. The big uh, theme of this exposition is look how great Tennessee is. And so indeed, Robert Love Taylor, who had been governor uh, about 10 years before, he had had that colorful election with his brother, the War of the Roses, in which his brother, uh, Alfred Taylor, was his Republican opponent, but Robert Love Taylor won. So he is the governor when the centennial opens, he gives an opening speech, the biggest convention held in Nashville during the whole five months of the ex exhibition, the World's Fair was the Confederate Veterans uh, uh, Association, the Sons of the Confederate Veterans reunion that takes place in June at the Centennial Exposition, as well as at the Nashville Union Gospel Tabernacle. The tabernacle won't hold the crowd. They build this balcony in to, to build, uh, to hold uh, additional seats, to create additional seats. Some estimate that there were about 16,000 veterans who came, which the Ryman Auditorium certainly does not hold 16,000 people. But Robert Love Taylor is going to give a speech at the Confederate Veterans a, a Convention here, and it is quite a remarkable speech. In the period of time that he was not governor between his first two terms and this third term, he had needed to raise money. He was in debt, and so he went out on a speaking tour across Tennessee and the South, and the theme really became talking about the good old days in Dixie. He had a kind of a set speech about Dixie, that he gave many, many times, but he really polished up his Dixie speech when he spoke at the Confederate Veterans uh, meeting. He really spoke to the crowd of what we had lost in his opinion and how glorious the days had been before the Civil War. I'll read you just a little bit of this talk because it is really quite fascinating and I'll put the rest of it up on Padlet. I doubt if the world will ever see another civilization as brilliant as that which perished in the South a third of a century ago. It's white column mansions under cool spreading groves, it's cotton fields stretching away to the horizon with toiling slaves, it's pomp and pride and revelry, it's splendid manhood and the dazzling beauties of its women placed it as the high tide of earthly glory. And then he gave the uh, ex-Confederates full credit for the advances that Tennessee had made since the Civil War ended, including not only, not only this civilization of the past, but including all of the industrial towers and spires of churches that could be seen around Nashville. Needless to say, the crowd listening to his speech really, really uh, were, were held in awe of everything he was saying. And, and, and not, I'm sure they were nodding their heads or really uh, stopping to clap for a while. He talked about the Confederate soldiers being so proud and such an erect version, even at this meeting, of the Anglo-Saxon race, the proudest type of Anglo-Saxon, that translates to a racial uh, emphasis, uh, were these Confederate soldiers. This is what he says about slavery. Slavery was dead, but magnificent in gloom of defeat. He, meaning the ex-Confederate, was still a master. Has he not mastered adversity? Has he not built the ruined South? Look yonder at those flashing domes and glittering spires. Look at everything the South is. 
and it is an uproarious speech that he gives. And it really does show that it's harder to move forward and easier to look backward. Next week, we're going to be talking about the women because the women are going to decide to get active in political affairs. Today, I want to give special thanks again to Humanities Tennessee, our sponsor. They have been great partners in producing this lecture series, and we are grateful to them and their staff for supporting our efforts here. Next week, we will be talking about the, the uh, progressive era, the era of reform. I will put some things up on Padlet uh, by Friday of this week, and that will be there for lesson one so that you can read some of these things. And I'm always happy to take your questions here, or you can send me an email. Thank you for your attention and good night.